Hello, everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. And welcome again to the Gussie's Gut Show. I want to bring on my partner at Gussie's Gut and good friend. I'm so happy to call him my good friend and an amazing veterinarian, Mr. Dr. Ian Billinghurst. Good morning, Rob. Lovely to be here. Um, and we have a very exciting guest this morning. This oh evening God. and this afternoon, wherever you are in this world. Yeah. I woke, I woke up uh, being, uh, I, I do with this show when, uh, you know, we have these great guests and I get really excited. But, you know, th this, uh, this guest is somebody that I first contacted when I wanted to move into homeopathic veter veterinary care for my dog. I, uh, I lived in California. His practice was in New York and I reached out. He was the first one that I reached out to. He was clearly the one that in America that was the most trusted and most knowledgeable, creating the most profound results. And the guy that I am, I like to go to the best. And he's actually his office is the one that referred me over to you. And uh, I then, then contacted you to introduce me to raw feeding and it's, it's all because of this man. Well, there you go. <laughs> yep. So without any well, further ado, let me let me just bring this man on because okay. this let's do that. This teasing is too much, but the to 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 do an intro for this man is pretty impossible. He's had an amazing practice. He's had a television show with Martha Stewart. He's a best-selling author. His book, The Nature of Animal Healing, was Hey Rob, the, Rob, Rob, Rob. Yep. The best person to introduce our next guest is the next guest himself. If you Let's, get do right it. Let's do it. <laughs> Marty Goldstein. Dr. Marty, how are you? Come on. <laughs> good morning. Right. Good evening. Good afternoon. It's great, great being here. It's always an honor being with Sir Ian. Boy, talk about one of my influences big time. <laughs> That's great. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. This, this is this is our honor to, to have you on. I know you guys are good friends. I'm sure you you have plenty of stories you're going to share today about each other. Um, and uh, I'll do my best to keep things moving. And I think this is probably going to go over our hour, but I want to try to keep it to our hour and we can do another show. Um, but why don't we just get right into the things because we really do have... I, the agenda I have, we could never do in an hour. So why don't we get into it? Um, Marty, why don't I give you the platform? I want to, let's just catch people up on, most people know who you are, but let's just catch people up on you and where you're at in life right now. And, and we'll start there. Yeah. You know, I mean, all these accomplishments, all the things that I did over the last 50 years, it was just my pursuit of the truth, you know, way back, I, you know, I attended Cornell undergraduate in the 60s. Now, that was a trip. <laughs> um, and then I stayed in vet school. I was there for a total of nine years. I graduated the Cornell vet school in 1973. And genetically, I was losing my own health. Uh, it ran in all the males on my mother's side of the family. And all of them now are long dead. They were sick. They degenerative. I had the same condition. So... I just started to search out of fear and especially vanity for answers that my medical profession did not give me. Uh, I had chronic bursitis. Uh, I was going for shots of, uh, I, I was going for ultrasonic treatments in my shoulder three times a week. They were going to inject long acting steroids, which is what I learned how to do for animals. And it was like, but, oh, you know, and my, my doctor, when I, I asked him, said, what is going on here? Uh, and he said, well, you are getting older. I was 26. But then the big question came is, why is my left shoulder getting older and not my right shoulder? Same body, but it come out of the birth canal earlier. <laughs> so it didn't make sense. And then I stumbled upon some oriental philosophy, uh, macrobiotic diet. And I tried it, and I was always fat. My nickname in high school was pork, in public school was Porky, 
when I looked down, I couldn't see my feet. My stomach was so big. And I lost 20 pounds in eight days eating brown rice and real food. And a light bulb went off to apply the same tenets to our own uh, companion animals. And lo and behold, it worked. And then I started to really go into depth and study pet food. At that time, we, what we were taught, and the only thing we bought and sold in our practice, and the only thing we fed to our animals was the semi-moist foods, Top Choice and, and Gaines Burgers. That's what we were taught. They were scientifically correct. And then just looking at the labels and the original label of uh, Gaines Burgers, there was like three or four carcinogens. There was dyes, coloring agents, uh, flavor enhancers. I mean, the only thing it was really missing was food. And I, it was just a wake-up call. I look back to my training in my four years of vet school at, the Corn at Cornell. Oh, hey, this is Rob Ryan, founder of Gussie's Gut. There are two opportunities I'd like to share with you. Number one, if you're enjoying this video right now, wait until you see the ones we have coming up. I invite you to subscribe right now to our YouTube channel right here below. And number two, if you'd like your dog to have a delicious sample of fermented superfoods that was developed with Dr. Ian Billinghurst that you sprinkle on top of their food and support their healthy gut, healthy aging, and cover the gaps in their nutrition, then I'm inviting you right now to go to gussiesgut.com forward slash sample. So just hit the pause button here on this video, subscribe, and then visit the website. Thanks for watching. Back to the show. And I realized that when it came to nutrition, I had a three hour course and it was not even about the quality or the ingredients of the foods. It was mostly about arithmetics, how to balance total protein, fats and stuff like that. There was no, you know, we never even taught anything about what's biologically appropriate. Those are the key words, right, Ian? Well, we should be feeding food that is not scientifically appropriate. You're, you're right, identical twins in how we came to this, but carry on. It's good. Yeah, it's, it's, it's just, you know, my definition in that book that I wrote, The Spirit of Animal Healing, my definition of, of the science in the field of medicine is man trying to figure out what nature already created. I, I'm kind of blown away by the technological advances in our profession. The MRIs, the dye studies, the fact that we know along a metabolic or physiological biochemical pathway, we know every little stop scientifically, the NADHs and the stuff like that. And, and it's amazing how we figured this out. And like, you know, Ian and the mitochondria, how we know every little organelle inside a cell and stuff like that. But guess what? We didn't create it. Nature did. So when we really want to get into health and healthcare, we have to look and abide by the fundamental laws and rules of nature. And science doesn't really do that. You know, it's, it's just... and. Uh, and I'm fond of science, especially when we can get science to help us prove that the work we've been doing with proper diet, nutraceuticals and supplements works. But man, there's nothing, there's nothing like my two associates that I adopted 45 years ago, which every veterinarian can adopt. That's nature and common sense. And the reason all of this happened, and I went through 40 years of hell. This was not easy. Threats to my license. Uh, you know, monetarily, it, it was horrible. You couldn't charge for alternative therapy because if one animal didn't make it, you lost your license because you weren't using pre-approved therapies. My license was verbally threatened in 1978 for treating arthritic dogs with glucosamine sulfate because I wasn't using standardized medicine. Do you know how much glucosamine sulfate is sold now in veterinary medicine? So that, that's how it's been for me. And I never did strive for...
for all this popularity, for all of these successes. My book is number one. The documentary on me is in the top 100 uh, nature documentaries of all time on Rotten Tomatoes. It's only because I love animals and I just kept on sticking to the truth. And I almost gave up many times, you know, is either give up all of this alternative natural therapy or claim bankruptcy. Those are my choices. And then I said, no, I, I just, I can't give this up. And I kept on working and struggling 15 hours a day. And then as the real trip was because I was ready to get out of practice in 1982, we created the company Lick Your Chops. It was funded by the Bronfman Seagram Seven, and it was almost syndicated by Motown. And that was my exit out because I was frustrated being a conventional veterinarian. And the reason I never left is I was starting to see tumors resolve in dogs and cats. And it was like, I can't leave this. This is working. So what happened is that word spread one by one, animal by animal from different parts of the, of the country. And I started to get referrals and seeing patients from all over the United States. At any given month, we had 20, at least 25 states of the union in our rating room. And we did a survey once back, oh, maybe 15, 18 years ago of my clients, not my associates, but mine. And in a six week period, my average client was 590 miles from my clinic. So it became really fun and interesting and really rewarding to, to, to do all of this and see all of this. But the basic fundamental is I did it because it's the truth, you know, especially when it comes to diet. It's the feeding biologically appropriate food. And the amount of, you know, my specialty really became the use, the scientific use of nutraceuticals. But it's amazing how many animals' lives got turned around just by feeding them real food. Right, Ian? <laughs> <laughs> That's my whole mantra. And... Uh, uh, nutrition, it's absurdly simple. You feed food. We don't feed nutrients, you feed food. Nutrients come along for the ride. It's quite simple. <laughs> yeah, it's quite simple. It's quite simple. That's that's the, that's the whole fact of the matter. It's simple. Yeah, it's and funny. In my, in my first book, I was commissioned uh, by Random House to do it. And uh, I was having a very tough time coming up with things that weren't already said. And I finally had to leave. I wrote this story in my second book about my first book. I got my friend Daryl and we just went down to Jamaica and I had to just see what I wanted to say. And we had a really good time for two or three days. And I said, Daryl, leave me alone. I went out over the edge on a cliff with a pad, paper, a little desk, and a bottle of Dragon Stout uh, made by the Red Stripe Company. And I was literally hitting myself on the head because every time I would write something, it was already said before. And then finally, like the movie, The Ten Commandments, when all of a sudden you saw, you know, The Ten Commandments written in stone, my hand picked up the pen. And I just wrote without thinking the 17 fundamentals of healing and health that went in my first book. And at that point, the book was done. But unfortunately, I was commissioned to write 263 pages by Random House. So I just took those fundamentals and extrapolated them into chapters and chapters and chapters. But it's simple. How do you heal a cut? You sign up to Google, you look it up in the dictionary. No, nature heals it. And then I really started to look at disease, dis-ease, an uneasiness about the body. And I started to assign a purpose to it. 
a discharge, a fever, a whatever you call it, there is a purpose for that. And what I was taught, and Ian, what you were taught when you went through four years of school is how to diagnose the disease and then drug it, which stopped the functionality of nature. And you know what that's called? Cancer. It, it, it's not more complicated than that. You know, if we allow these processes to go through and supported these processes with proper food and nutraceuticals, nutritional supplements, where modern day drugs actually came from, but they didn't have side effects. And then we allow the body to go through the process. Then it, we heal. And, you know, probably the most important chapter I ever wrote in both of my books is called The Healing Crisis. And it's allowing nature and recognizing that nature is healing the body. What is a fever? An aspirin deficiency? Hell no. It's a process used by nature to do something. So that was it. And, you know, and, you know the bacteria and the virus became an enemy. How many strep bacteria do you have on your throat right now, Rob? Yeah. <laughs> Are you like a dollar for every bacteria in your intestine do you have a yep. sore throat no so these bacteria are actually good guys and then they're, they're, they're saprophytic and you get really congested in, in your chest and then all of a sudden it starts to come out the bacteria are opportunistic they start to grow in that yes you don't feel good you got a sore throat it creates a fever but it's digesting the mucus debris that's coming out you use antibiotics and kill the bacteria, you'll feel better quickly. But what happens to all of that junk? It goes back in the lungs. And I started to look at the case histories of my lung cancer patients to see they had chronic upper respiratory infections successfully treated throughout their life. And result, health? No. And result was cancer. So, you know, that's it in a nutshell. I think I just presented the entire four-year training of veterinary medicine. <laughs> Rob, you now have your degree. You're now a veterinarian. Yeah, thank you. You just bless me right now. Well, it, you know, we on the on the last point you made about the microbes, we now know we have, and we didn't know this that long ago, we, ne we now know we have more microbes than we have cells. Absolutely. So, you know, if you, if I was to tell you, well, you know, take this thing so you can kill off some of your cells, you'd say you're crazy. But here we are, we're trying to kill off our microbes. So it uh, doesn't make a lot of sense. Yeah, I mean, it doesn't. And it's just, you know, studying the microbiome right now, I'm starting to see the expansiveness where you could actually look at it as this, not only the center of your intestinal health, the center of your immunity, the center of your thoughts, but the center of your household, the center of your neighborhood, the center of the planet, and the center of the universe, when you take it on an expansive level of what the microbiome is, it's a trip. <laughs> it's it's a major trip. Yeah. Major yeah. Trip. yeah it's, no, it's, uh, us. It's, it's us. It's part of us. We are part of it. We yep. are part of this part of it. <laughs> ecosystem. It's it's interesting, Marty. You came from the perspective of understanding disease, understanding what disease is. I came from the perspective of saying, "My God, this food we recommend causes disease. We have to stop doing that and feed real food, so the disease will disappear." So right. we we were aiming at the same thing, but from different perspectives. And, of course, the end result is about the same, that we end up with healthy animals. Uh, and the food has a hell of a lot to do with it. Yeah, you know, I mean, I, I really became known for the veterinary treating basket cases. And, you know, turning so many around. I mean, I have so many documented turnarounds right now that I just literally attacked my alma mater, Cornell, with a presentation saying, here's case after case after case after case. Three weeks to live, six weeks to live. Here's four biopsies. Here's this, here's that. And here's the number one oncologist in the United States giving this dog six weeks to live. And on this 
therapy program of proper nutraceuticals and diet. Here is the dog nine years later. And one after another, after another. And then I just said to the head liaison at Cornell, you can't do this. It's about time you learn. It has nothing to do with ego. It has nothing to do with finances or anything like that. You don't know how to do this. You're not teaching this in your school. Your goal is animal health and welfare. And, you know, when I graduated Cornell in 1973, from observations, approximately one out of 10 dogs got cancer, and it was always a disease of the old. So what we were taught back then is when you saw a case, make a differential diagnosis of all the possibilities. And you eliminated cancer from your differential diagnosis based solely on age. Now, statistically, and I, I presented this, this study in my book, one out of every 1.61 dogs in the United States get cancer, and it's a prominent disease of the young. So something is drastically wrong. If we're so astute scientifically, why have I witnessed the incidence of cancer in dogs triple, maybe even quadruple? Something is wrong because there is no health care taught. And the, the beauty with me is I became known for turning all these basket cases around. And then at the end of each of these successful cases, the little light bulb goes off either in the mom and dad of the companion animal or I'll shove it into them, is this work that we just did, a hell of a lot less expensive than chemotherapy, and your dog is now four years down the road running around and the tumor's gone. Imagine if you started doing this when they were young. <laughs> you don't, not only would you save all of that finances, but they would have an enjoyable, healthy life and they wouldn't have to go through the suffering or unfortunately the amputation or whatever. And it's like, and this is what our profession, Ian, needs to know. So you take an animal born, I don't consider any animal born healthy anymore because of how we adulterated the gene pool, you know, over the years, seeing a two and three month old animal with terminal cancer, but taking them when they're young and concentrating solely on wellness, no disease. And when people ask me, what should I do to prevent my dog from getting cancer? The first thing you want to do is get that word cancer out of your vocabulary and not even focus on doing anything for disease because on the higher level, you know, there's 53 perceptions in the physical universe. Man has five. Taste, smell, feeling, you know, all of that, that stuff. So what's going on in the other, you know, 88%? How many radio waves, how many gamma rays are hitting your body right now you're not aware of? Take an infrared picture of a dog and a person, and you'll see overlapping energy fields in the infrared spectrum. So... So much is going on. Thought, feelings, emotion are on the non-physical plane. So you start thinking cancer, you could help that tumor grow in your dog, not even realizing you're doing it. That's why the, my, this book is called The Spirit of Animal Healing, because it takes it to a different level, the spiritual connection between people and their animals and how much we could learn from them. <laughs> Boy. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what's that other big thick book to your left there, Dr. Marty? What's that other Is one? Ian book? <laughs> <laughs> By it's... the way, Ian, when you gave that lecture in Canada, taking back cancer two billion years, I lost my breath. I had to go into the hallway just to recapture my breath. It blew me away. And, and it's all true. Learning that the the micro the uh, that the what's that little dude inside the energy cell guy 
learning that, that that it was an individual of its own so long ago. It was a bacterium. And th that lecture just blew my mind. And it was like, and then, there, you know, we were interviewed after that. And, really? I can't remember. <laughs> I think it's yeah. a while And I was a asked, so, you know, what was your first exposure? And now that you met Ian and you heard him lecture, when you were coming up to Canada, tell us your feeling about, you know, meeting Dr. Ian and stuff like that. And you know what mine was? Fear. <laughs> because you see this little pin over here? Where it is? <laughs> if you watch the documentary, The Dog Doc, and you should, if you love animals, you just have to watch this film, not because of me or anything, because it really shows the need for integrative veterinary medicine. In the dog doc, there is a scene of my animal pin collection. And the person that did the dog doc, a really good friend of mine, actually spent $5,000 that, for that day to bring in a, an interior designer to go through one of my drawers, clean it out, put beautiful uh, cloth down and rearrange all my pins. I have like three, 400 beautiful animal pins. And not a day goes by that I don't wear one of those animal pins. And you'll see it in the documentary. But when I was in Cornell, what I used to have was not animal pins, but I used to have buttons. And I had this amazing button collection. And they were, you know, with balloons. And those were the psychedelic, you know, years of mankind and this and that. But there was one button that I wore every single day. And I still have that button. That was the prelude to my pin collection. And that button was question authority. And when I went through all of what I went through in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, I didn't have the wherewithal to challenge anyone scientifically in the medical field, you know, that had these long, you know, letters after their name. So I mostly just worked on animals and stayed in hiding. But I, I knew I would, my question of the authority of scientific medicine was not correct. Then when I started to feed what I thought was correct and made the switch to raw diet, I didn't know what I was doing. And Dr. Ian Billinghurst was the authority on it. So I was really afraid I was doing it wrong. So I actually feared meeting that guy because he was going to, he was going to come down to me just like the veterinarians did throughout my history and you know to tell me oh this is wrong you can't use so glucosamine sulfate you can't stick needles in animals and do acupuncture that's wacko you know when i was certified in 1975 so my first experience of you in was fear <laughs> <laughs> that's great that well, you, met, you met a fellow acupuncturist oh yeah that was the uh, the gateway, that is the gateway for alternative therapies into conventionality, finally. You know, it's over 70% of the vet schools now in the United States embrace acupuncture. And, you know, I did acupuncture, Marty, that introduced me to a whole load of people who were doing alternative things, and they were also studying acupuncture. And at that point, we had been feeding our animals with commercial food because my family said we have to feed our animals with the best food available, not the bones and scraps that we've been doing before. And it was in that period, my animals were all, their health was declining and they were, they were teaching me an important lesson. And these people, when I was studying acupuncture, introduced me and I said, the light came on for me and I said, oh my goodness, <laughs> what I was doing before was actually correct. The very simple right. things I was doing. And I can't stress enough, 
And of course, I read people like Pitcan, for example, Belfield, um, Juliet de Baraclay Levy. And somewhere on television, at some stage, there was some vet called Marty, who was a vet to the stars. And I was in awe of this man, as I still am. Absolutely. So two people in fear of each other for whatever obscure reason, <laughs> meeting, and then becoming instant friends. Wonderful. Okay, just because we're doing the same exact thing, it's just common sense on both sides of the world. As, it, I think that's one of the um, words I use in, in Give Your Dog a Bone. Practical, common sense way to feed your dog for a long, healthy life. Yeah. Simple. One well, of those you're... fundamentals in my original book was health is simplistic. Disease brings in complexity. Absolutely. I mean, yeah. you know, how do you heal a cut? It's simple. But disease, the entire medical training, you know, is one of the most complex mind mind washing brainwashing things studying these latin terms of the muscles that the sternocephalicus hyoides and this and that your mind gets just washed out when nature is just nature created that muscle <laughs> nature created the disease so that's great you know uh i i when i went to you via phone consult um uh, and boy you were hard to get into marty um and uh, your your clinic was nice enough to refer me to your brother, Bob, who is another mega talented veterinarian. Oh, God, yeah. We, we did a lot of together. <laughs> a fantastic veterinarian. My dog cured in four weeks. It was inside four weeks from first appointment to um, what I would consider, quote, cure and resolve forever. Gone. In your documentary, I just want to reiterate for people that they can go on and find this documentary streaming. You hold up a disc, but you don't have to buy it on disc. You can get it on Amazon, Apple, everywhere. The Dog Doc, I highly encourage you to watch it. It's incredibly um, optimistic and hopeful and shows you that even dogs with incredibly uh, um, serious uh, diagnoses and um, you know, given days to live can can live. I mean, this this man has has given dogs nine years to live when they've been given weeks and months. So um, there's hope, and that that documentary I think does it. It's a feel good documentary that I, I I've seen it two and a half uh, yeah two and a half times, almost three times. Yeah, hope, hope is a biggie. I wrote a paper, and it's in 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 this book. The paper was called "Hope Precedes Healing." You know how. The first thing I did with so many of these terminal animals, these people didn't know why they were there. They were there because someone told them they had to go and this and that. But they were told by the specialist that their dog is going to die. And they came in, you know, especially the husbands of the wives is like, I'm just coming to support her. I don't know why the hell I'm even here. You know, my dog's got terminal cancer. It is just going to be a waste. And I would spend an hour just reestablishing, not false hope, but hope. And they would leave smiling and feeling good. And one of the things I, just, I wrote in this book is when I saw people that were local, I had the time to take blood samples and not start a program until I saw the blood results the next day. You know, with the people that drove in six, seven hours, you load them up on a whole bunch of supplements because you have to start quick. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, they would leave there smiling, laughing, feeling really good because I would just show them before and afters, before and afters, before and afters. And I would, you know, they would call the next day for the blood results. And I would go, hey, how is she doing? You know, she's, she's already better. We didn't do anything ex except change the viewpoint of the of the people and change their atmosphere around them to one of hope and healing and you know and, and there's so much on that level that probably supersedes any supplement and any diet we know of especially if you put them together then you just have wellness wow uh, uh, marty you spoke about cornell can you tell us a little bit is and before we came on air, you spoke about your changing things there because 
as Rob and I have spoken so often, it's the veterinary profession that needs to change. Can you talk a little bit about what you're doing with Cornell in that area? Yeah, what, what's really interesting with Cornell, I mean, it, you know, it was my alma mater. Uh, the documentary ends with me speaking at Cornell. And that was arranged by the, the lady that did the documentary. And I gave a 35-minute talk. I presented 223 slides in 35 minutes. And I shoved it right down their throat. And it was mostly students, and they they just, they loved it. They absolutely loved it. They stayed for another hour asking me questions and stuff like that. Uh, and if you go on, for anyone out there, if you go to the Dog Doc Facebook page and you scroll down, my lecture at Cornell which was 35 minutes long, was edited to 30 minutes, and you could see the entire lecture of me to the Cornell faculty and the students. So what happened in my life, you know, the last 15, 20 years in practice was really frustrating because I was spending an hour, hour and a half initially with one new person with one very sick animal trying to educate one person and trying to save one animal's life when I knew I could reach literally millions, which I'm finally doing now. So after 47 and a half years, I was able to sell the practice and you'll see the practice really good in the documentary and turn it over to veterinarians I actually taught. So it's still doing that work and starting to reach, especially with my food and supplements, I'm getting thousands of testimonials of thank you every month, every two months from people all over the United States thanking me for how well their dog or cat is doing on either the food or the supplements. And rapidly, which is blowing me away. So... Now that I've actually caught up on life, it's been 50 years since I graduated vet school and I have the products and the food out there. And I actually went through a one and a half year process of not feeling guilty every morning, not going to work for 15 hours. And it took me a year and a half because I did it for almost five decades of just struggle, 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 work, work, work. Then I said, you know, now it's time to go back to Cornell. So uh, through this amazing lady, Karen Arison, who was subsidizing alternative therapies at Cornell, the small animal clinic right now, this lady is just amazing. Through her, I got to one of the head liaisons to the public in Cornell. We had dinner up there when I, I brought my oldest daughter who was interested in going to vet school uh, months ago. And then through Karen, we set up a Zoom call and I did a 90 minute presentation to one of the head liaisons at, at Cornell on case after case after case after case after case. And then at the end, I said, Amy, you guys can't do this. It's time to learn. How do we do this? And she's in the process of trying to work out now an off-campus talk where I would go up there. We would rent a hall. We would give the veterinarian, you know, the doctors that they would invite. We would give them food, get their attention. They won't be bombarded by, if it's at the school, getting an emergency call from the clinic. And I would just give a presentation on the use of alternatives and the use of proper diet in turning these animals around. And then whatever they want to use of me, you know, it was very interesting. Many years ago, Cornell was nowhere near advanced of the vet schools in the United States in cancer. Colorado State was. The American Cancer Society dumped a whole bunch of money into Cornell. 
they hired a veterinarian out of the University of Pennsylvania, Dr. Rodney Page, and they started the Cornell Cancer Program. I went to a fundraiser in southern New Jersey on a Sunday in the winter to attend Dr. Rodney's presentation. I went up to him with a whole bunch of before and after pictures. And when I introduced myself, he goes, I know who you are. I read your book and I actually liked it. I presented before and after cases. He invited me up to the Cornell University Veterinary College. We set up a protocol because one of my specialties, my big specialties, and you'll see it in the documentary, is the use of cryosurgery to freeze tumors at a very high level. So if you have a tumor inside a dog's jaw, they'd have to remove half the jaw. If you freeze the tumor, the body rejects the tumor and lays down new scar tissue. So it's tissue sparing, it's less invasive, it's, it's amazing. So I, Rodney Page started a program with me where he was getting one year mean survival on dogs and cats with what's called squamous cell carcinoma. And it was usually radiation, removing half the jaw and chemotherapy. And that one year of life was not a good year. We were getting two, three, four, five years. So he said, if you could get one year and you're using much less invasive things, there is a publishing study. He assigned me a recording secretary. He gave me the forms. This was the breakthrough of forever. Wow. A month or two passed. I didn't hear anything. I called him up and I said, Rodney, what happened? And he goes, unfortunately, I couldn't get the words Cornell and Goldstein on the same page on an endowment. <laughs> That's wow. how it was. So I presented that to this liaison saying, if your Rodney Page accepted me years ago, it's time to just revisit it. Let's get it together. Boom. What is happening? We're waiting to hear. This was about four weeks ago. And I'll, I'll be on her. And this lady, Karen, who is now, not only is she subsidizing alternative therapies, the first time I, I, I met her, I went up to the Cornell Conference, the annual veterinary conference, where veterinarians from all over the world are speaking four, five, six at any given time for three or four days. And Rick Palmquist, who is one of the best integrative veterinarians, was lecturing there on the microbiome. And I went, I better go support Rick. He wound up being voted the most popular lecturer of the entire conference. And this Karen Arison was doing a, she does the concert for the animals, where she brings in these two world-class violinists with these two world-class violins that plays concerts to the small animals, the large animals, and to the public that attend. And I, I went up there, I met her, and at the conference, at the concert, she awarded five scholarships to five of the clinicians at the Cornell Veterinary School to become certified in acupuncture. And it's like, who is this lady? <laughs> so she is now my ally in doing this. I just got elected as a board member to the American Holistic Veterinary Medical Foundation. I invited her on and she accepted. So we're going to start doing stuff. Rob, um, and Marty, I, this has brought on just a story that was part of me, where in 1984, we had a lecturer from North America, and I can't tell you who it was. He was a surgeon, and it was a lecture on surgery, surgery of the um, mouth, the, the uh, jaw, the head for cancer. And I recall he was saying, don't worry about any structures just cut a margin of three inches around whatever it is, maybe more. And he had then had pictures of dogs with their tongues drooling out the side of their mouths. Thank you. And I walked out. 
I think it was the first I walked out because I already was studying acupuncture. I already was using simple nutrition to see things disappear. And I knew this was not right. But the disfigurement that they were happy with, it made me almost want to vomit. It was so bad. Ian, explain what a margin of three inches means. Well, <laughs> taking out the whole side of your jaw on one side. So your mouth, in the case of a dog, you know, when a dog's tongue lolls out, it just lolls out the side. And it is so disfiguring. Oof. It is so ugly. It is not a way to live. And half of these dogs couldn't eat anymore anyway. They had to be hand-fed. I was horrified that this was what our profession was doing back then. Wow. Wow. Yeah, you know what's so wrong about that? It shows the focus with cancer is on the tumor. The tumor is not the problem. The fact that the body allowed the tumor to grow. So the whole concept of wide margins. So if you get a wide margin around the tumor, where did the first cancer cell come from? The garage? <laughs> Brooklyn? Where did it come from? It came from inside the wide margin. And one of the joys is I went to a continuing education seminar about three years ago on cancer. And they're now starting to go against obtaining wide margins. Finally, they're waking wow. up. Wow. The beauty about cryosurgery is it freezes right into the healthy tissue all the cancer gets rejected, and the area that gets frozen but doesn't die gets stimulated, builds up an immune reaction locally and systemically against the cancer. So it's a double stimulus to the immune system. And it's, you know, some veterinarians are doing cryosurgery now, but they have a little can of liquid nitrogen, and they're freezing warts. I mean, we're doing cryosurgery on tumors that big inside the rectum, inside the ears and stuff like that. I lectured at Cornell also to, they had a holistic organization maybe eight, nine years ago. And it was a two and a half hour lecture. Check this out. And at the beginning of the lecture, a very distinguished gentleman walked into the back of the hallway about 10 minutes after I started the introduction. Had no idea who he was. And, and when he walked in, I was so taken back by him, his presence, that I said, oh, you're here. Now we could start just fooling around. He stayed for the entire lecture. I presented three or four cases of mast cell cancer and cryosurgery. And he was the head of surgery at the small animal clinic at Cornell. His own technician's dog had mast cell cancer of the leg. He was scheduled to amputate the leg. After my lecture, he told the technician, I am not amputating. Bring the dog to Marty. We had it all set up. She had a death in the family. She had to stay up in Ithaca for the funeral and the services. By the time that was over, the tumor took over the leg and he had amputated. So once again, that's how close I came <laughs> with Cornell. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Notice how red I am. I was just in the sun intensely for for two days. Well, I think it's your lighting. It it just changed. Maybe the, the natural lighting changed, but uh, you look great. Well, let me let me turn this up. But no, I mean part of it is a a lot of sun that I got. And you know. That's another fallacy that the sun causes cancer. Yep. I mean, like I said in this book, why would God make the light in his own house harm his own children? So I bake in the sun every year. The more I bake, the healthier I get. I don't have any wrinkles. I'm 76 and a half years old. I don't have any wrinkles. Now I'm all red and stuff like that because I was out gardening for eight hours in direct sunlight. But yep. No sunscreen. We, we are going to no see sunscreen. Marty in the next 
20, 30 years, tremendous problems having developed from the what's called in Australia, slip, slop and slap sunscreen. Stopping that vitamin D in our bodies is horrendously oh. bad. And we're doing it to our children. And we oh. think we're doing the right thing. But I'm convinced we're doing the wrong thing. Great for the... Uh, like yeah, so, much, so much that we do. Great for the in sun. the name of goodness, we are doing so much bad. You know, it's a problem. In my first book, The Nature of Animal Healing, you know how I learned this? I used to go to Jamaica every year with friends of mine. And every winter I would go for like, like two weeks. One week I went, one year I went to Jamaica for health. And I just, I rented a bike. I just ate pure vegetables and fruits. I didn't drink. I was running on the beach every morning. And I tell you, no exaggeration, going towards the end of the second week, and I was baking in the sun. I'm talking baking. Alert from no bankruptcy in 147 hours. days. That's Ian's <laughs> computer. My computer. Ignore oh. And <laughs> I... At the end of two of, of the vacation, towards the end, I literally looked 20 years younger. My eyes were bright. They were light, much lighter green and blah, blah, blah. And then there was a Rita Marley concert. Bar Marley's sister, right? I think so. And I said, the hell with it. And I went to that concert and I just pigged out. I drank all these coconut drinks and alcohol, had the greatest time. I woke up the next morning and I had wrinkles. My eyes were all puffy. So we think that the sun causes that. But for two weeks, I baked in the sun and I had the clearest complexion. Then I ate a whole bunch and consumed a whole bunch of crap. And the next morning, I had bags under the eyes. I had crow's feet and wrinkles. And I wrote it in the book. So where does that come from? The sun or what we consume? It was a huge lesson for me. Don't you think uh, there's a lot of, in the human world, we, we're we now starting to, to think that it's the proliferation of omega-6s uh, the canola oil, seed oils, the, the grain that the cows eat, the food that we eat, and the, you know, that non-grass-fed cows. Yep. And, and then on top of that, the increase in our iron and the interaction with the sun on our skin. Do you, do you agree with all, that? Yeah, all pro-inflammatory. Yep. Yep. So if you're eating a healthy diet and you're, you have a healthy mindset and you're exercising, you can be on the sun. There's no big issue. Yeah, the thing is, you know, one of the fundamentals that I wrote in my first book is health is not so much about what you put into your body, but you allow your body to get rid of. Amen. You know, why do we have to sleep so long? Because we have to break the fast in the morning, breakfast. <laughs> and you know, what saved my life the first year was after I was on ma macrobiotics and I started to get healthy, I did a seven, nine, and 11 day fast in one year. And boy, did my health come back. Yep. And now, you know, what I do, you know, after I retired, I started to make up for lost time. And I've been having a really good time the last couple of years, you know, going out, having, you know, IPA beers, red wine, eating here, eating there, because I couldn't do that for, for so many years. And... And I'll get really congested. I won't feel good, this and that. And I'll just go on a cleansing and get rid of it. So it's always, you know, one of the things I, I teach is, and you know, and Ian does it too, you know, we teach the ideal biologically appropriate diet. Yeah. But I also have 10 steps that I wrote about on, you know, I don't eat the perfect biologically appropriate diet every single day. I love pizza. It's not biologically appropriate, but it's knowing the, the different levels, especially in your companion animal. So my dogs love pizza. I'll throw them the crust and this and that, but you know where to go to. 
So the big thing is to aim in the direction of appropriate diet and know where to go, especially if your animal gets sick, then you start going to, you know, number 10, the top of the list. Yeah. And, and that's where you, your dog has cancer. You're not messing around. A dog is one year old running around. You have them on a great diet. Yeah. Throw them a pizza crust. <laughs> yeah. I'm into all of that, Marty. Um, it's the knowledge. I am so much about empowering people with knowledge, educating them. If they want to go down that path, at least walk down that path because you know where it's leading. And if you want to jump off the path and get on that path, great. But at least you know what you're doing. And we as professional veterinarians, as a group, we don't know where we're going with all of this. So there's no way we can educate the people right. know where they're you know, going with all of this. We don't really know. That's, I mean, that's the, the, that's where the schools need, need the wake-up call. That's right. That's exactly right. I tried to write to our, I've written to my veterinary association on numerous occasions, asking them to consider this. They do not even reply to me. They do not give me the courtesy of a reply. And I'm a member. <laughs> I can't believe that, is, that the Australian Veterinary Association is so poor. But I, I guess I can believe it because they are funded by pet food companies. Everything they do is funded by these people. They well, yeah, it's all, they're all they subsidized. They the master. Yeah, they're all subsidized. The other, yeah. the other place I'm going to right now. Are you aware of Angel Memorial Hospital? I know the names, and I know it's very famous. Um, never been uh, there. Yeah, years ago, I had a, a Samoyed with renal failure, and. My client knew one of the heads of it. She brought it up to Angel. And this dog's renal failure was so big and it had high blood pressure. It was getting nosebleeds from the high blood pressure, blah, blah, blah. So I put the dog on proper diet, nutritional supplements. The dog turned around. So the clinician from Angel called me and said, what are you doing? And I just said, well, you know, this is blah, blah, blah. And she said, how would you like to come up and speak? And I said, I would love it. Nothing ever happened. Years later, when sonography was just starting, I had a golden retriever that had an insulinoma, an insulin-producing tumor of the pancreas that was found by the number one radiologist in the United States out of Cornell, Victor Randano. And he found it on a sonogram. And the dog was on prednisone, blah, blah, blah. They came to me took the dog off drugs, put it on nutritional supplements. And a year later, the dog is not, I think it was nine months later, the dog is doing great. So they lived in Boston where Angel Memorial lives. Ithaca, Cornell is seven hours away. So we need a follow-up sonogram. The people go, we can't drive seven hours. The dog hates the car. Is there any other place that would do sonograms? Because regular veterinarians were not doing it. So I said, you have Angel Memorial in your area. Why don't you go there? So they went there. Who does the sonogram? The same resident clinician from years back. She calls me up and she goes, tumor's gone. What are you doing? <laughs> now you have to come up and talk. So I, 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 I said, yes. The head nutritionist, board certified nutritionist, I am not going to mention her name, but Ian, you know who she is. She gave me so much. <clears throat> she, she doesn't row the same boat that I, I row and this and that. We need your curriculum vitae for this and that, blah, blah, blah. And I called the clinician and I said, we, you know, continue education. I'm going to be speaking for 50 minutes. You want me to present all of integrative medicine in 50 minutes? And she goes, yeah, I get it. What do you want to do? And I said, let me just give you guys an introduction. And she goes, okay. So I'm all set to go up. It's, the lecture is at 8 o'clock in the morning. So I go up the night before. That day, the day before, she calls me. She says, you still coming up? And I said, absolutely. She goes, I just want you to know 
you're going to be talking to a hostile crowd. Oh. <laughs> and I went, what? And she goes, yeah, there are veterinarians in this area that are taking animals off chemotherapy, putting them on homeopathic remedies. They're dying. And there's a very bad taste at Angel Memorial for what you're doing and represent. Great. You still have time to back out. <laughs> and I said, no, I'm coming. So I go up there. I go in 7.30 in the morning. And Angel Memorial, the waiting room looks like Grand Central Station. It's all stone. It's huge. It's lined, Ian, you'll love this. It's lined with racks of science diet. All <laughs> over. <the> <laughs> and I'm waiting, getting a little nervous. And I look at the board of staff veterinarians. You ready for this? I count 101 doctors on staff. I thought Angel Memorial had eight or nine vets. So now I am really, really nervous because they are going to kill me. So we walk into the amphitheater. It's downstairs, no windows, straight upstairs like the Roman Colosseum. And I watch these veterinarians file in at 10 to 8 in the morning with cups of coffee in a really bad mood listening to a holistic veterinarian. And I panicked and froze. 80 of them showed up. And I'm looking at them. And I just couldn't start. Because I know I was dead. And I looked at them. And I said, you know, I want you to know that I know what you're thinking about me. Because I used to sit there. Matter of fact, when I sat there, I was number two in my class at Cornell. So I know what it takes to go from your viewpoint sitting there over here to what I'm about to represent. And what I'm about to represent is true holistic medicine. But what you're used to is what I call assholistic medicine. <laughs> and one by one, they started to applaud. And a few of them stood up and gave me a standing ovation because I identified what was on what was inside of them. And I presented 183 slides in 50 minutes. We got done. They took me into rounds in the clinic. And the head of Angel Memorial came up to me and said, so in other words, we're doing it all wrong, aren't we? And I said, you are, but I can't leave you with that idea right now because you don't have to handle it. So let's work together. And I was too busy. They were, they were three and a half hours away. So I'm going to go back up to Angel Memorial because the number one surgeon in the United States that just did work on a dog of ours from, that we rescued, he's the number one reconstructive surgeon in the United States, Dr. Pavletic, he's a great guy. And he is the expert on reconstructive surgery, especially tumors of the head and jaw and this and that. But Ian, what he's doing is what you said before, he's probably removing their jaws and stuff. So I'm gonna go up, back up to Angel. The clinician is still there that I dealt with, this is over 20 years ago. And I'm gonna get a meeting with her Dr. Pavletic, show them cryosurgery, show her nutraceuticals, and enter Angel and Cornell. Then well, I can go to my grave accomplished. <laughs> I just hope you are the thin end of a very powerful wedge because this sure isn't happening in Australia. I can't even go and talk to the veterinary students. They won't advertise it. They won't let them know I'm coming, even if the students request it. I am forbidden to talk. One of the reasons is because I've been associated with a, a uh, the manufacturer of some raw food. So the people who proudly display hills on all their jackets and on their doors and everything else in the waiting room wouldn't have this little raw food producer come in because it might promote his business, which I'd sold anyway. Can you get me to talk over there? I would love to because I think 
you are required with those slides and your powerful message we need you and i'm so yeah. pleased to hear this is happening i have really i've learned how to break through the veil because i stayed conventional for 47 years so i know what they're thinking i know what their thinking process is missing and i could identify with them and i can yeah. do it and you know the, the, the big thing for me because i was literally so condemned literally worked in hiding in 2007 i scored martha stewart and oprah winfrey the same year and at that point the view point on who I was switched and I used to in my lectures say you know I'm not there the two two of the three most powerful women on the planet I'm not their veterinarian because of looks and personality this stuff works so it is time and that was the start of my being able to Dealing with Oprah every day when her dog was terminal and turning it around, that really strengthened me. You know, Kelly Clarkson said it so well. What doesn't kill you only makes you stronger. <laughs> <laughs> I want to count the arrow holes in my back. They are many there. And so, I, I you know, I just have the ability right now just from – so much experience, so much turmoil to go up with anybody and just say, all right, I know what you're thinking about me. Here's the truth. I need you to listen to me. Give me five minutes. Look at this one case. Mm -hmm. And then, oh, look at this other case. And look, you know, whatever it is, blah. Yeah, what, what a great approach. That's a great approach for all us all. Just come yeah, at it absolutely. from... Uh, you know, you started the the show with you know that you've only come at this with truth. So, it's um it's that is definitely your fo you follow that path and it's uh, served you well. Yeah, and and especially the animals. That's all I care about. <laughs> yeah, that's great. I want to get into food and you know what you're doing at Dr. Marty. So, you know, I'm I'm really fascinated by. I've looked into how you're making your food and I've looked into the balance of nutrients. Tell us a little bit. And this is really, um, I mean, it's pretty groundbreaking stuff. And your your food business is fair. I mean, in the in the scheme of food businesses, it's fairly new and it's gone just crazy. You know, it's it's really gone well. So tell, tell us about it. Yeah. And here's, I want to touch on a couple of things. I mean, the, the company that I contracted with, they're amazing. They're at the highest level. They have 25 lines in the human field before me. You know, the number one line is Stephen Gundry, the cardiac surgeon who wrote the book, The Plant Paradox. So they have expertise, not only in the creation of products, but how to educate through dissemination. They're yep. geniuses. So that was a blessing for me. I was, you know, my last few years, I hooked up, and you'll see him in the documentary, the guy that actually owned the kennel that I rented space on called The Shack. Yep. You know, he worked for uh, Boar's Head. Then oh. he got his own farm, and he makes some of the – High, maybe the highest quality raw meat diets I ever, ever, ever saw. I it's bet. amazing. And so we were selling that at my hospital, and this is what our animals were eating. But I was looking at how to get that product across the United States. Yeah. Refrigeration, shipping weight, refrigeration and shipping, refrigeration at the receiving, then this and that. And this company is, is has expertise in freeze drying. And I think, well, freeze drying is processing. There's nothing like the real raw food. And I started to study freeze drying process. And it's amazing, you know, especially the studies on blueberries yep. that 
you take blueberries at the highest level of antioxidant concentration. And as they sit in the store until you buy them, that level of antioxidants goes down and down and down and down. Yep. But if you freeze dry it at the peak, that antioxidant level stays consistent. Yep. So all of a sudden this was like, whoa. So you're freeze drying, <clears throat> you're securing in the highest level of nutrient value. Yep. You're knocking the weight down tremendously. It's tremendously shelf stable. Yep. Months and months and months. Many months. You're, and you're taking the water out, so your chance of pathogen contamination goes way down. So you have like four or five slices of cake and eat it too. So yep. we then started to formulate with all foods, especially organ meats. Love because it. Because that's, you know, it's, it's not really present. And then, like I said before, getting it to a point where we're making the APCO regulations by not adding any supplements in, doing everything by studying the nutraceutical value of the supplement in food. So, oh, the sun is right in my eyes now. So this is at the plant. This is our supplementation, one of the vats. And you can see carrots in there, spinach, kale, blueberries and stuff like that. So we actually got it to a point where we're making whole food freeze dried. Yep. And the number one thing is the animals just love it. They just love it. But Ian, you're going to love this. <clears throat> Their first formulation was four different protein types. And we were doing a ton of food allergy testing on our patients in the last 10 years. Not 100% accurate, but accurate enough to know that if I'm going to make a food containing four different meat proteins, I'm in trouble. I just know it. And they said, stick with us because the animal is going to love it. There's different nutrient properties of each of the different foods, the turkey, uh, you know, the fish, the this and that. So I stuck with it. Animals loved this food. And all of a sudden, they have a customer service team of 250 people. Oh, I wasn't getting complaints. Oh, and it, it also, they will do a 100% refund. This is how confident they are in their products. 90 days after you buy it, even if you return the empty bag, they'll give you a full refund. We weren't getting requests for refunds due to food sensitivities or allergies. So when I was getting asked this in podcasts and interviews, you know, aren't you concerned about the different meat proteins in there? And I would say no. And they asked me, why do they think that is? I would just say that it's because we're using very high quality meat proteins. Then, maybe a year and a half ago, I stumbled upon two scientific papers on advanced glycation end products called AGEs. And mm -hmm. how AGEs are the foundation for inflammatory and allergy reactions in the body and what causes the formation of AGEs in food, heating. Mm. Ah. So we were not heating the food. We were freeze drying it. So what I'm feeling right now is so much allergy to different food types out there, like an allergy to chicken or an allergy to beef, may not be an allergy to the beef so much as it's an allergy to the AGEs form when they process the beef. Mm. Marty, you are so 100% right. This was one of the earliest things I saw. 
that the so-called allergies to proteins were due to the cooking process. Now, this was before we knew about advanced glycated end product or AGES, and it's what a wonderful acronym AGES is. Because AGES, it's, right? It's exactly. exactly what it does. So, yeah, your observations, my observations, the, the just the clinical facts that real food doesn't cause this when it's fed in a biologically appropriate manner, which is raw, which is the way they are designed, our cats and dogs, to eat this food. It's a simple. Hello? A simple. <laughs> simple. And yet so much science is devoted to dealing with the sickness caused by cooking and all those other things that we do to adulterate the food. We don't have to have that problem. And this is what blew me away in the first place. Take away the dreadful food, which is the, the politically correct food, which is now I call, I call now a poison chalice, and replace it with actual real food. Problem solved. Problem solved. It, it suits a very lazy person like me, let me say. Marty, it's wonderful to hear you confirm that. And, and your science and, and what you're actually looking at confirms it in a very positive way for those skeptics out there. You are the man. Yeah, you know, I, I don't read veterinary journals. I don't have time to read it in general. And I picked up one about a year ago that was at least three or four years old. And it's not a journal. It was a one of the magazines. And in there was an article by the head nutritionist, board certified nutritionist in our profession. And they were actually saying how all these grains and cereal byproducts they're using are, especially corn, a source of such ideal protein. And how the use of the word filler to describe these components they put in is so against veterinary science and reading this article made me nauseous. Wow. <laughs> I mean, it really is. The, you know, Martha had me, I, I, Martha gave me my own radio show called Ask Martha's Vet on Sirius for six years. Every week for six years. It was one of the joys of my life, how many people were calling in. But she also had me on a TV show a number of times. I think the first or second time she had me on, and her TV show was sponsored by one of the big pet food companies at the time. They allowed me to put the formula of that food, it was either that food or science diet, without the name, obviously, of the company, on the screen, and the first ingredient was corn, and the producers allowed me to turn to Martha and say, Martha, have you ever seen a dog stalk an ear of corn? And I found out that they got more calls after that show than they got in the last month of every all the shows, just by that common sense. And when I lecture, I put a, uh, a photograph of the skull of a dog and a cat. And I just say, show me one tooth in a dog or a cat's mouth flat for grinding grain. So why are we making these foods? 50, 60, 64% processed cereal byproducts. It's crazy. Crazy. Absolutely. With our, with our remaining time, Dr. Marty, let's real quick, can we touch on vaccines? What, do you, what is your current thought? I'm, I'm, I'm impressed since I got my first dog and, and when I met you, it's now 23, 24 years ago. Um, you couldn't even say that word. And now we're seeing a lot of vets that, that are starting to talk more about the proper implementations of vaccines in a, in a health schedule. So can you tell us a little bit more about some of your views on that? Can you touch on that? Yeah, it's probably my number one passion because I think it's causing more harm than anything else. And it's the insanity of how we embrace vaccination protocols in our profession. And when I go through this so many times, you know, with 
with clients. They br bring their terminal animal in. And when I touch on vaccines, you know, what about vaccines? Oh, don't worry. We're all up to date. And I say, and I start to discuss how that is not necessarily correct. And some of them really come back like, you know, like I'm crazy in this and that. And I just easily put the light out by saying, when was your last polio shot? And they freeze. When was your last measles shot? Are you up to date? And this and that. I became aware of this situation way back in the 80s when I was turning animals around all over the United States that were coming to me for chronic illnesses, seizures, tumors, allergies, name it. And all of a sudden, I would get a panic call. She had three seizures last night. The tumor started to grow back. And the first thing you do is ask, you know, have you anything different? Have you changed the diet? You know, have you gotten a new dog? Whatever. And I heard over and over again, no. <clears throat> Matter of fact, our veterinarian was really impressed on how well she was doing when we brought her in for annual shots. And I just started to hear that and hear that. And I went, oh, shots. You know, they were... That was what we were taught. That is the health. That's health 101. So I started to look at it and look at it and study it and study it. And now it's become a truly, truly brutal insanity that we are giving animals all their vaccines every one, two, or three years. It was... God's gift to veterinary medicine, Gene Dodds, at the International Symposium in 1997 that changed the recommendation from every year to every three years. She yep. presented two studies, Dr. Ron Schultz in Wisconsin, that showed the minimum duration of protection from a canine to stepper shot when properly given up to one year of age was seven to 15 years. And then my next door neighbor at Cornell, when I was in vet school, I was in a condo complex and Fred Scott lived above me, on the floor above me. He became the head virologist in the history of Cornell Vet School. Wow. He did a study on feline distemper or panleukopenia, and he published it in JAMA, the Journal of the American Veterinary Medical Association, that showed that litters of kittens standardly vaccinated up to one year of age, when challenged with live distemper virus, had immunity again for seven years, most for life. So Gene presented those and got the recommendation changed from every one year to every three years. Why not every seven years? Yeah. So now, in a nutshell, the insanity is we're giving the Great Dane and the Chihuahua the same dose. USDA studies show that the Great Dane dose could be up to up to seven to ten times what the Great Dane needs. Yeah. And we're giving that every single year. The documented side effects to vaccines in the literature right now is huge. Huge. There is a medical condition in human medicine called the allergic breakthrough phenomena. Gene Dodds wrote about it because it's also in animals where the vaccine instigates an autoimmune response of the body's own immune cells against its own cells. Yep. This is all proven. And she took a study in France with Ron Schultz where they vaccinated dogs standardly for rabies up to one year of age then they, they took titers every single year to test the immunity, challenged the dogs with live rabies virus, wow. and not one dog got rabies for eight years. They replicated the study. It's called the Rabies Challenge Fund, and they, they did it up to five years. Do you know why they didn't do it the eight years? Because the, US, the USDA ran out of live rabies virus. Yep. So it ended there, and they proved that standardized rabies vaccines 
the minimum duration of protection is at least five years. So why are we publishing these animals with all these virogen components, let alone the other stuff in there, the antifungals, the, the thimerosal, the adjuvants that cause more damage than the vaccine itself. And I tell you one thing, if you want to read anything, read the one chapter in the spirit of animal healing that I wrote on vaccines, updating my chapter that I wrote 23 years ago, and my very, very dear friend is in there who is now running for the president of the United States against Joe Biden, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. And read what I quote him because he is the real deal when it comes to the true harm of vaccines in children. And he's coming out publicly with science. Mm. How come all my redness went away? <laughs> You're welcome. Marty, you, you, you asked a question, why are we doing this? Let me tell you what happened for me. In 1975 was my last year in, at vet school. We were taught puppy shots a year later. That was it. Oh. By 1980, we'd had a rep come around from one of the major vaccine manufacturing companies. And they told us we have this scathingly brilliant idea. <laughs> Why don't you vaccinate every year? Because we need to get animals in for a wellness check. You need that as an excuse. The vaccines are harmless. They can only do good. And it may be that one or two animals out there don't have a good immune system and they don't have a great response. So we could see no harm in the profession advertising that they need to be vaccinated every year. The Australian veterinary profession took it on like crazy. And that's where it started in Australia, at least from a position of never doing this to a position of this was what this became standard. No science, nothing at all beyond the fact that there was a, this was a marketing campaign by a vaccine manufacturer. Hmm. That was the beginning of it in Australia. I don't know about America, but that. Oh, was I know in, in America. It was in the 70s. It was one doctor at Cornell. Oh, I just went blank on his name, but the Cornell Foundation is named after him. And what he did is they started to do titering and test immunity. <clears throat> and they found that a number of dogs didn't retain immunity from the distemper vaccine past a year. So, first of all, the vaccines were very low quality. The testing procedures were very, very low. And what he did is he came out with a blanket statement that because we're not 100% certain that all vaccines are going to generate immunity beyond one year, let's standardly vaccinate every year, and it'll be a huge monetary benefit to our profession. Yep. I, I, I went blank on his name, but it's, you know, the, the, the foundation of, of the Cornell Vet School is named after him. I'll, I'll think of it. It's in the book. Yep, but those those were roughly the words, except that they didn't give the science behind it. They just said, we're not sure. Therefore, right. this is what we must do. Crazy. Wow. It was yeah. it crazy. And it's just, I mean, once as a practicing veterinarian, once I became aware, and the, the thing about the vaccine is it's almost a delayed type immunological response anywhere from seven to 65 days. So you give the vaccine, everything is fine. And then 32 days later, they the dog has four seizures or the tumor grows. You don't pinpoint it on the vaccine. So that is the problem with the vaccine. And then once you become aware of that and you, you saw as many seriously ill animals as I've seen in my career coming in from all over the world 
and you go into the history of when the condition started and you look back at three weeks before he got all his vaccines and then you Buddy, there's something out. else i need to add to that a different experience in australia because we were feeding mainly raw foods or at least half the vaccinated population were being fed raw foods we were not getting these reactions the wow. raw food was actually blocking those bad reactions right because and they're, they're they're yeah absolutely yeah and i recall a lady catherine o'driscoll who sadly has passed away she began a campaign because she was seeing it, what you were seeing in the united kingdom the terrible results of vaccines being given to animals being fed this poison chalice food this politically correct food and this was what and i found it difficult to believe because i was not seeing that and i didn't at that time correlate it with what they were being fed but you know wow. hindsight is wonderful and you can see how this has evolved this epidemiological situation that as we increase the pc food we increase the bad reactions to vaccines Absolutely. Which, ironically, possibly the fact that those early studies were dogs who didn't retain their immune status were probably being fed poison chalice. Yeah, correct. But of course, Catherine, they weren't Catherine was a guest on my on my Martha show a couple of times. Oh, she was. Yeah, we had a ball talking about vaccines because she doesn't hold anything back. <laughs> no, she didn't. <laughs> no. So, well, yeah. She actually, she actually got me started on the road to getting the message out there because she was the one who invited me to England in the late 1990s to lecture based wow. on the book with your dog a bone. And from there, uh, was, I was taken to the United States by a lady called Kathleen Chin, who was running the a lot of the, the uh, lectures in America. But um, we never crossed paths at that stage. Oh, you would have been on my show. You would have been on my show all the time. Are you kidding me? <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, I would have had you on. <clears throat> with, a, with our remaining minutes, Dr. Marty, what do you think of fermented foods? Uh, microbiome. It, I mean, it, it's just, you know, my first exposure was when you fermented wheat berries and instead of, you know, I do a, grow a lot of wheat grass, but if you ferment the wheat berries and change the water every single day, it makes this funky, smelly kind of, I forgot what it was called. It actually has a name for it. Hmm. <clears throat> And the more I drank this fermented stuff, the better my bowel movements were and the less they smelled. And wow. I started to see the antithesis that when you start to put the correct bacteria naturally into the intestine and it creates you know, a healthy microbiome, the rest is history for health, the way you feel, and, you know, fermented food is, let's call it the biblical way of doing this. <laughs> the Methuselah way of doing it. Great. This has been a phenomenal talk and uh, it's been really enjoyable. So thank you for spending this. Gosh, we've we've gone an hour and a half. This has been just flown How by. Did How did you get my, my, my color novel? <laughs> I, I, I wish I could take credit for it. <laughs> um, I, I think it's the lighting. I don't know. Do you, do you have natural lighting in there? Well, the, yeah, the sun kind of, it's, it's indirect. I have a shade down over here. I got my, a couple of lights. Yeah, Earlier on, be Marty, it was beaming directly on you. Yeah, for one time, the sun, it, it hit a window over there and it was coming into me. Yeah. But that was just for like like 10 minutes. I was moving. I That's couldn't right. see you guys. You might have you might have been eating some St. John's wort or something that is photosensitizing. Uh, yeah, there, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> so that's basically it's a pleasure. Anytime you want me on, this is my life now. 
it's been it's been amazing. There's there's actually a lot more. As I said at the beginning, I have a huge note uh, full of things we couldn't we couldn't probably take care of in four hours. So you, we'd love to have you on and and uh, and always pick your brain. Your wealth of information and your um, both have both you and Ian. I you know I was a kid who grew up in Los Angeles around celebrities my whole life. I worked in Hollywood for a bit of time and having both of you guys. You guys are my Rolling Stones, having you both on and being able to be here. I'm watching you. It's it's a bit odd. It's very surreal for me because I look up Who's to you. And, horses, uh, Rob, Rolling Stones. <laughs> <you're right. laughs> I I admire you both greatly, and I really appreciate you being on, Doctor Marty. Oh, it's a hey, uh, pleasure, Marty. It's been wonderful to be in the same room with you, so to speak, again. I enjoyed your company so much when we were together in Canada. Get me over there. I'll, I'll come over there and speak. We'll hang out. We need to do that. I'm not sure how we can do it, but we do need to do it. Yeah. I mean, I'll... I'll, I'll fly over there with you. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, what, what? we'll have now a bowl. There's, there's we'll a plan. Just, we'll break through. What are the universities over there? Which ones? Well, there's Sydney, uh, Melbourne, right. Queensland, and Queensland. Uh, West Australia. Yeah, there's a few. That's great. Are they doing any acupuncture? Are they breaking through at all? Um, well, there's a very strong acupuncture society with the uh, holistic group of vets. Um, so, yeah, vets are definitely practicing it over here. They have been for a long time. Uh, I don't know that any of the schools, but I'm not, I don't have anything to do with the schools. Um, I'm not. Simply because I, I just sit in my own little pond and, and do whatever I do. But um, <laughs> I'm never invited to the vet school, so I have no idea what they're doing these days. Yeah, one of my big joys is, you know, when I became certified in acupuncture, that was the start of the criticism. And, you know, I used to go to continuing education uh, seminars, and I, I was really getting criticized for that. And then I just dropped out of veterinary society to do my thing. And th now I go back to continuing education. And a lot of these vets that were criticizing, they are certified in acupuncture now. Excellent. And they come up to me and they go, you know, <clears throat> you were so far ahead of your time. And I would just go, acupuncture has been around over 3,000 years. I'm not ahead of my time. I'm just 35 years less behind than you. Just wake up. And that's it. You're not ahead of your time. I didn't create the needle. I didn't create herbs. I just, I just woke up. You you oh. sought truth, Marty. You sought yeah. truth. That's right. That's right. Well, unfortunately, and I do mean unfortunately, we have to come to an end. But thank you for joining us, everybody. And again, thank you, Dr. Marty, for being on today. A pleasure. Anytime, I'm here. We appreciate that, and we'll take you up on that. Yeah. Have a good day, everybody. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm.